Miracy. It's simple stuff like if somebody's leaving a course, a conference, have you developed checklists? Have you asked them to do simple things like put time on their calendar to do X, Y, and Z over this period of time? Have you connected them with accountability partners to help them as they move along after the course? Hello and welcome to Course Lab, the show that teaches creators like you how to make better online courses. I'm Ari Ini, the Director of Growth at Miracy, and I'm here with my co-host, Abe Crystal, the co-founder of Rizuku. Hey, Abe. Hey there, Ari. In each episode of Course Lab, we showcase a course and creator who is doing something really interesting, either with the architecture of their course or the business model behind it, or both. Today, we welcome Jeff Cobb to the show. Jeff Cobb is the founder of Learning Revolution, as well as the host of his very own podcast, Leading Learning. Thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So to kick us off, I would love to get your kind of 30,000 foot view of yourself, as well as how you came to the course building industry. Sure. I think like a, a lot of people, I sort of stumbled into this world. I was working on a graduate degree many, many years ago in a galaxy far away. And just by chance, happened to start doing some part-time work for an e-learning company, a startup. This was back in the dot-com days when this was the first round of people throwing a lot of money at tech and e-learning and started working for a firm that had a contract with the University of North Carolina where I was. And one thing led to another and ended up leaving graduate studies and uh, working full-time for this startup and moved out to California for a while. And when everything finally crashed and burned with the dot-com days, I sort of came walking out of the dust with having made enough to start a company of my own. And my wife and I started a company about 20 years ago now that was really focused on being an online course creation company. That's what the company was. We actually ended up creating an online course platform as well and built that company for a while and eventually sold it and then started the company that I have right now back in 2007. So I've been involved with you know, either making courses myself or helping other organizations make courses and sell courses for more than 20 years now, I guess. So tell us a little bit more about kind of what you're up to today in the course building landscape. I think, you know, probably like everybody else trying to figure out where AI is going to fit into all of this going forward. So, you know, definitely experimenting with that. But I think also just, you know, really both for ourselves and for the people that we try to advise and give guidance to at Learning Revolution and in the other parts of our business, just really trying to figure out what works the best these days. It's become very crowded out there in the course landscape. You know, 10 years ago, doing a course was something special. Even five years ago, it was somewhat special. But now it's a lot like the book publishing industry. If you talk to any sort of solo consultant, expert, coach, that sort of thing, you know, it used to be they all wanted to have a book and publish a book in some way, shape or form. They still do. But now you talk to them and they all either, you know, want to have a course or already have a course. And, you know, so there are a lot of courses out there. What's it now take to actually stand out and make that a significant part of your business? And we're always really focused on that. So, I mean, I'm very curious. What have you found? Like solve all our issues, Jeff. <laughs> I would not say that I have a, you know, one size fits all code to crack it. But, you know, I think uh, some of the things that we're always focusing on is what are the results are you trying to achieve and, and where does a course fit into actually delivering that value in the end? And that, I mean, that's kind of, you know, foundational one-on-one type stuff, but it's what you have to really go back to now and say, okay, you know, first of all, is a course the best fit here? And to the extent it is, what role is it playing and then what we're seeing with courses, and I know Miracy has seen the same sort of thing, is the way the market has changed, there's a lot more emphasis on what I would characterize as complementarity and contextualization. So two big sounding, you know, PhD fancy words, I guess, but complementarity is just kind of what's going along with your course to help make it more valuable or what's your course complementing to make more valuable. Coaching is obviously a big one and there's the one that really stands out. So course in combination with coaching, something I know Danny is focused on a lot, but you know, it could be other things like practice opportunities, connecting it with a play space event. We're very big into blended learning opportunities these days. So what are you complementing your, your course with to make it as valuable as possible? And then contextualization, you know, I have in mind, you know, what are you kind of embedding it in really in terms of the community, the people around it to make the experience richer than just the content? What's the context 
of the course. So, you know, obviously there's a, a lot of focus out there around things like membership sites. We like membership sites, but we really like membership sites that have that strong community aspect to them. So whether you're running a cohort on a sort of structured basis through a, a course or series of courses, or whether you have just sort of a broader community that's housing your courses and, and brings people together, that's becoming more and more important and more and more important to do well. And frankly, those aren't easy things to do well. Right. I mean, we're in a much more mature phase of the course business right now. And so really stepping up your game and mastering some of those areas is, is becoming increasingly important. And so I'm curious, I mean, as you said, like none of what you've mentioned is kind of brand new and yet doing it well is very, very hard. And so what is the current within your own courses, within the courses with people that you've worked with and you've seen, what is a big differentiator in creating that piece, especially around the contextualization, like the complementarity that it depends a lot on what additional services do you have? What else do you have that can fit in with the course? But on the contextualization side, what have you seen recently that people have leaned into and worked really, really well and made kind of the biggest difference? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, what we found is, is important in that sort of contextualization in community is you really have to look at facilitation skills of the people involved and like how effective are both the, the subject matter experts who are involved, but then also the participants in the community in understanding and then being able to enact, implement effective learning. Because when it comes down to courses, when it comes down to community, any of these things, the source of value, the basis for value for what people are ultimately paying for, what's ultimately going to lead to the results is learning effectiveness. Like if you're not actually creating an effective learning experience, the value is not going to be there. You're going to have a hard time attracting people in the first place, and then you're going to have a hard time getting them to come back. So we, we have a lot of focus on that. In fact, one of our main courses right now that we work with in various ways is called Presenting for Impact. And it's really about helping subject matter experts be more effective as teachers in those teaching environments. That's more aimed towards formal kind of presentation, delivery of lecture type content environments, which is important. Something that I want us to move into that we haven't yet is to focus on kind of less formal circumstances. So if you're in just an informal learning community where you've kind of, maybe you've got the courses embedded as we've talked about, but you've also just got all of this peer to peer and peer to expert type learning going on. How do you get great at that? What does it look like to be not just a good facilitator, but an excellent facilitator of learning and achieving that learning effectiveness? Where do you think the gaps are there? Like, where are you seeing the differences between sort of an average facilitator and a great facilitator? Mm, I mean, we've kind of broken it down into kind of different components of how you engage with people, starting with how you sort of effectively get and earn their attention in the first place, which to a surprising degree doesn't happen a lot of the times. You can maybe get that initial spark of attention, but then being able to retain that attention and actually establish connection with the people that you're trying to help learn just often doesn't happen. It just, it'll fall off after sort of the initial value proposition might be very strong from a marketing standpoint. And it might come across strong in the initial, you know, moment or two of whether it's a webinar or a presentation or whatever it is, but then not getting to where you've got the level of, of empathy and understanding with your audience that you're really making that deeper connection, that often doesn't happen. There's a fall off right there. And then even once you do that, you know, something we've also started to focus on a lot lately is the role of practice and application in learning experiences, which again, there's just a surprising lack of when you look at a lot of what's put out in terms of online courses and other types of learning experiences, because it does tend to be very lecture driven, more or less. I mean, somebody's presenting their ideas and it might be great stuff, but if you're not making those, you know, very conscious places where you're pausing, where you're structuring what your learners can do in order to apply, to practice, to reflect, to make it relevant in their own experience and then bring that back into whether it's the community or the course or whatever your delivery method is, you've got to do that. So you have this fall off with initial attention. You have this fall off around establishing connection. You have a fall off around providing practice opportunities. And then what often doesn't happen with course and community type experiences is setting up the follow on to the whatever learning has occurred. Because we all know the experience of like going to a conference and you go to a bunch of sessions, you're getting on the plane to go home, you're all charged up about all the great things, you know, that you're going to do. You get back to the office, nothing happens. So how do you really 
equip the learner exiting the course, exiting the experience with what they're going to be able to do during the following days, weeks, months to really make that learning stick and, and be a part of their lives. So being conscious and really thinking through those different elements of engaging with your learners. Just curious if any examples come to mind that might make that concrete for people as it's like what that might look like, either examples from your clients or courses you've created. It's simple stuff like if somebody's leaving a course, a conference, you know, have you developed checklists? Have you asked them to do simple things like put time on their calendar to do X, Y, and Z over this period of time? Have you connected them with accountability partners to help them as they move along after the course? Those are all things that we would do as part of our presenting for impact course. It's something we've, you know, we consistently recommend any client do in the context of their course experiences. You know, backing up to connection, this is obviously going to vary so much from audience to audience, but the power of storytelling, which you know we all know about, but how do you start to incorporate stories into what you're teaching that, that relate to whoever your audience is? They're going to be able to see themselves in that story and really actively moving beyond here's my didactic content that I'm putting into the lecture to here's the story I'm telling that really illustrates the need for the content that I'm offering to you and inviting the, the learners into the story to see themselves in that story. The other thing that's coming to mind is for people who are more in the solopreneur or independent expert world, are there lessons they can learn from what you've seen in terms of how organizations approach creating courses, creating learning experiences that might translate to independent experts that are looking to improve their courses or improve their businesses. Many of those organizations have the same sort of issues that the solopreneurs have in terms of, you know, competition, price pressure, delivering learning effectiveness. They all have to work with subject matter experts, you know, you, and often on a volunteer basis, you know, to get them to create the courses. So there's a lot of overlap um, between the two. But one of the things that those organizations often have in their favor as they've got some form of basically credential that'll go along with whatever they're offering. But that can be sort of more or less formal. I mean, some of them are, you know, big organizations with certifications in their field and industry, and that's just a powerful thing to have. And the average solopreneur is not going to be able to do that. But because they're coming out of that sort of culture, they think about things like just putting a digital badge on this or adding a certificate that's more than a certificate of completion that has, you know, a little bit of teeth to it. That's going to add value to the learning experience. It's going to make it easier to charge and charge well for it and potentially make it more valuable in the marketplace. And I think a lot of solopreneurs, you know, small consultants, coaches sort of don't think of themselves as being in the position to create that sort of credential or that sort of kind of validation of the learning experience that they're offering. But I think they can. I think that's open to them. I mean, they're not going to be the project management institute and, you know, have that level of authority, but you can add that, you can add some authority to what you're doing. I think that's very important. The other thing that is really grown a lot in the sort of larger organization world. And for us, this often means like trade and professional associations that we're working with, is they're really thinking much more in terms of business to business selling now, even the ones that might have traditionally sold to just the individual doctor or nurse or, or lawyer or whatever, they're now going to the health system or to the big firm and saying, you know, buy our catalog or fund us creating this course and buy a thousand seats of it um, to put your learners through. And again, I think your sort of average smaller creator may not be thinking in those terms, but that opportunity is there, you know, to find businesses. And a lot of times this can take a significant amount of the risk out of investing substantially. What if you can go to one of your best clients, if you're a consultant, and say, will you either directly underwrite the course, the cost of this, or will you at least commit to 50 people going through it or whatever the number is so that we have some numbers against this? And then, you know, really consistently looking at those business to business sales, because it's much easier to make that one sale of 50 seats than it is 50 sales of one seat. So one question I have based on the certification piece and kind of adding that credential you know, as you mentioned, it's a lot easier for a large organization, you know, the institute of whatever is going to find it a lot easier. to. So can you talk a little bit about what that might look like for a smaller, you know, a solopreneur or a smaller organization? Sure. 
I mean, the mechanics are going to be pretty much the same. What the larger organization usually has going for them is that they're sort of a known quantity in whatever industry or profession they're serving. They've got some brand behind that. So for the smaller player, brand is incredibly important. I mean, that's something we emphasize a lot that, you know, you need to really think through how you want to be perceived out in the marketplace as a provider of learning experiences, you know, as a core part of what you do. You know, what should people be thinking of in terms of the validity, the authority that you bring to that situation and actively work to build your brand in that way. So you are seen as somebody who can validate that somebody has these skills, you know, this expertise. I think it's probably, you know, even more important for that small producer to be as buttoned up as you can around the learning experience. So have have well-designed learning experiences that lead to whatever credential you're going to convey. Do have an assessment associated with it. Don't just give something, you know, for completing. You want to show that learning has actually happened. Do be very good about obviously collecting the sort of social proof that goes around that, around really the results that people have been achieving from it. Generally speaking, a credential is only valuable if the employment market values it. So, you know, thinking about how you can build employer relationships in whatever field you work in. If you're a consultant or a coach, you've probably got these business clients who respect you. So again, you know, making them aware of that credential, getting their input on what you really need to be validating in terms of the credential, what the learning needs to lead to that they want to see in people that they might hire, and making sure all of that's communicated in, in your marketing, that this isn't just, hey, my LMS happens to give me the ability to issue a certificate, so I'm tacking a certificate on it, but I've really thought this through. This is what it looks like to be validated for me. And thank you for that context, because I could see a lot of solopreneurs going through. It was like, okay, I could provide a certificate, so sure, may as well, without understanding what really needs to be there for it to be of value. Yeah, I mean, you have to be careful because if you're just sort of, you know, slapping your logo on a certificate and handing it out when somebody completes your course, you may be damaging your brand more than helping it. So you have to be aware of that. Are there things coming to mind for you based on what we've talked about so far that you think would be good to share with people or anything like other things that we haven't mentioned that you think would be useful? Well, I think there's a lot of experimentation going on out there right now. And I think some of that is because of what we were talking about earlier that, you know, it's just a much more crowded market. It's a different market than it was a few years ago. People are trying to figure out what works. But that's also combined with the fact that we have had things like AI come along with video, with all the tools that it can help you with creating. So you have this need to figure out what's working and you also have this new set of you know, tools and technologies that are incredibly exciting that are creating new opportunities. So I think there's this sort of kind of a ferment out there right now that predicts some really interesting things are going to emerge from, you know, in the next year or two that we're not really even thinking about right now. Very cool. Awesome. All right. So Jeff, where can our audience go to learn more about you and leading learning? I'm going to point people to our Learning Revolution site because I think that's probably the, the best for this set of listeners. So that's at learningrevolution.net and lots of great resources there. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. It was a pleasure having you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Enjoyed the conversation. Now stick around for my favorite part of the show where Abe and Ari will pull out the best takeaways for you to apply to your course. All right, Ari, there's a lot to talk about here. Jeff was, he was dropping knowledge, <laughs> which makes sense given the depth of experience he has. Yeah, so one thing that really did jump out at me is he didn't specifically say this, but he kind of implied it by the way he was talking about the different aspects of the learning journey and kind of the importance that every single step along the way has, kind of the intentionality of just thinking about each of these steps, you know, the importance of the facilitation, being able to grab attention, kind of creating that connection with the learners, being able to support them in actually applying what they're learning what that follow on is, because I think we've all had the experience of going through some kind of learning experience and just loving it and then not doing anything with it. And so just the intentionality of thinking about all those different steps to create a real transformation for people is critical. And I really appreciated him sharing that. Yeah, I mean, that's partly why I asked him about what can independent experts and solopreneurs learn from the organizational world. And I think that's a big piece of it, right? So if you look at what organizations, whether they're nonprofits or companies, 
are doing with courses, they tend to think about it more strategically, right? They're thinking about, hey, where does this fit into our business or our mission as a nonprofit? And what are we going to do to ensure that the courses or could also be events or other learning experiences that we offer are actually effective and actually make an impact for people? And that's not some big revelation, but it's also not necessarily how a lot of kind of solo course creators think about it, right? You know, we see them kind of attracted to the idea of a course because a lot of people are talking about it, or it seems like it could be a new revenue stream. And so just taking a step back from that can be really helpful. And, you know, it might actually tell you like, hey, maybe you're like, you shouldn't be creating a course this week. Maybe you should be creating it in a few months, you know, after some other things are solidified. But even if it is time for you to create a course and you, you have, you're ready to do that, like thinking about it in terms of what is the impact the course is going to make? How does it fit into what I'm trying to build for myself? And how is it really going to work for my customers, right? my course participants? So it just, I guess, kind of bringing more strategy and reflection into the course creation process could benefit everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, his word for that was complementarity, which I don't know if it is a real word, but still super critical. Jeff has coined it. Well, and then they, you know, we also talked about how it's important to think about how a course you're offering fits into the context of your overall business, but also what your participants need. And so again, it gets into this issue of kind of hype and like people have been attracted to membership communities. They were sort of the, after the hype wave kind of crested for courses, you know, the next hype wave was, oh, you have to have a, you know, a membership, right? And again, that can be really great in some cases, but you don't get a successful community just by starting one. You get a successful community by having a strategy for it and by, as Jeff mentioned, having the facilitation skills to actually make it really valuable for people. And making sure that it actually, as you said around strategy, you know, it's both that it fits in with your product offerings and fits into the way that you're building your business, but also that the context of it actually makes sense, that the structure of it is actually what's going to support your students and not just, oh, this is, you know, this fits into my business. I could see this working well as a revenue stream, but if it's not creating the outcomes for the students, then long-term, it's a bad play. Yeah. And then finally, just, again, we've talked about this in many different ways on Course Lab, but it's just a message that needs to be reiterated again and again just in the way that Jeff described it was in terms of like practical application within your course experience. And too many courses are still built from a content centric perspective, or maybe they're combining content with, oh, look, you can have discussion in the community and that's how you engage around the content. And that's all well and good, right? Fine to have those pieces in place. But the point is people need to actually do something with what they are learning and if you're not guiding them to do that and giving them structures to help them apply, if you're just leaving them to figure that out on their own, they're unlikely to really get like meaningful application out of the course. And so it's surprising in a way that this is, I think, still such a big gap. But we could, you know, we continue to see this in course design again and again, that people are not giving clear guidance as like, hey, here's what you need to go do or practice or apply. So that's something we're going to keep harping on until things improve. And there's always going to be more room for improvement. So I don't see us stopping at any point. All right, awesome. Jeff Cobb is the founder of Leading Learning and the author of Leading the Learning Revolution. You can learn more about him over at learningrevolution.net. That's learningrevolution.net. Thank you for listening to Course Lab. I'm Abe Crystal, co-founder and CEO of ReZQ, here with my co-host, Ari Eni. Course Lab is part of the Mercy FM podcast network, which also includes such shows as Once Upon a Business and Making It. If you don't want to miss the excellent episodes coming up on Course Lab, make sure to follow us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And are you enjoying our show? If so, go ahead and leave us a starred review. It really does make a difference. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. All right, all right. Do you know who we've got coming up for the next episode? Yeah, we have Alex Price. He runs a course called AI, Human-Powered Innovation. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it.